Previously, we looked at prisoner of war camps in Britain, where enemies such as the Germans or Italians were held during the Second World War and following it. We established in this video that the majority of POWs were treated very fairly, and that the death rate in Britain's POW camps was incredibly low when compared to other countries such as the Soviet Union. There was allegedly though, a prison and facility in Britain that did have a much more sinister reputation for its treatment of SS personnel and members of the Nazi party. The London Cage was an MI19 prisoner of war facility which was used to interrogate captured Germans. Join us today as we look at this rather interesting facility, and remember to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Throughout the Second World War, the United Kingdom did interrogate and screen all of its prisoners of war. They used the term cage to describe a place where the interrogation of prisoners would take place, and these cages were established over the United Kingdom. Each were manned by officers trained by Alexander Scotland, the head of the prisoner of war interrogation section of the intelligence corps. After the interrogations at the cages, the prisoners were then sent to different prison camps based on a series of characteristics, including how ardent Nazi they were, for example. There were nine cages established across the UK, with the London cage being one of the most prominent. Each would vary in what they delivered and how they were equipped, for example the Doncaster cage used part of the town's race course as a camp, and the one in Loughborough was even in a bare field. The London cage found at number 6, 7 and 8 Kensington Palace Gardens, in a rather beautiful and spectacular part of the English capital, had space for around 60 prisoners. Between July 1940 and September 1948, these magnificent and beautiful homes were transformed into one of the country's most secret establishments, right in the heart of the wealthy in London, and today some of these houses in the area are worth dozens of millions of pounds. The London cage was fitted with five rooms specifically for interrogation and was staffed by ten officers and a dozen NCOs who served as interrogators and interpreters for the prisoners. There was extra security provided selected by their muscle and strength in case any issues would arise or hostility would arise in the cage. Lots of British NCOs were also fluent in German and were known for being rather good in persuading prisoners to pass over information and intelligence and some also wore Soviet uniforms to intimidate the Germans due to their fears of the Russian soldiers. The point of the cages was to extract information that would help the Allies win the war, so the use of interrogation was key. The London cage itself though developed a reputation as a rather notorious and infamous place, and accusations of ill treatment and torture have been levelled at the houses of 6-8 to eight Kensington Palace Gardens. A barbed wire fence separated the three houses from the busy London streets, but behind this, as wealthy Londoners got on with their daily duties, it seemed something dark was happening in the cage. In total, 3,573 men would pass through the cage, and more than 1,000 were persuaded to give statements about Nazi war crimes, which could be used in evidence, and even after the war, a number of German civilians were interrogated there until 1948. Accounts of torture or ill-treatment at the cage are varied. One British young airman noted how when delivering a rather defiant SS sergeant to the London cage, he was shocked to see how a German naval officer in full uniform was on his hands and knees cleaning the entrance hall. Whilst the officer was scrubbing the floors, a huge British guard was stood with his foot on the prisoner's back while smoking. Alexander Scotland, who ran the service, wrote a memoir after the war which was submitted to the War Office, However, he was forced to abandon this and was even threatened with prosecution under the Official Secrets Act if he published it. Inside the book, it showed how Scotland detailed different breaches of the 1929 Geneva Convention. Scotland himself was a rather strange man. He had previously surprisingly served with the German army in the early 1900s in southern Africa and even spent time as a German prisoner of war during World War I, with him later serving as an officer in British intelligence. He even met Adolf Hitler himself in Munich in 1937, before signing up with British intelligence in 1940. Inside his book, Scotland had bizarrely written about a number of instances of ill treatment about his time when running the London cage. There were episodes of torture in which prisoners were forced to kneel whilst being beaten around the head, or were forced to stand to attention for excruciatingly long times, even over a day in one time. Prisoners were also threatened with execution and unnecessary operations if they didn't cooperate. Scotland stated in his book that things were done that were mentally just as cruel also. 
In one instance, a prisoner was forced to strip naked, an exercise which greatly humiliated the German man, and this broke him and he ended up talking and revealing information. Prisoners also were forced to stand all day, and if they needed to go to the toilet, then they just had to wet themselves, and this humiliation could sometimes lead to results. The Red Cross were also refused access to inspect the facility on humanitarian grounds, as Scotland believed that the prisoners were criminals. Scotland's character himself is questionable, as rumours about his conduct in the 1940s would plague him, as he allegedly broke the jaw of a captured German agent whilst under interrogation. Also at the London Cage, guards were ordered to knock on some prisoners' doors every 15 minutes around the clock, to deprive them of sleep during interrogation. Some prisoners were even threatened with electrical devices, and were severely beaten, and even were told they could be deported to Russia for confinement there. One famous case of ill treatment at the cage is that of Fritz Nerchlein. He claimed at his war crimes trial, whilst accused of committing the murders of 124 British soldiers, that he had been ill treated whilst at the facility. He said he was stripped, deprived of sleep, kicked repeatedly by guards and also starved. Also Nerchlein stated how he was forced to walk in a tight circle for four hours, however when he complained of his treatment it got worse. After this he was doused in cold water, pushed downstairs and beaten further. He also stated he was forced to stand next to a hot gas stove before being showered with freezing cold water and that he had to run around in circles whilst carrying heavy logs. He would also state that other prisoners were often beaten until they begged to be killed to be put out of their misery and they were told they could be made to just disappear very easily. Nerchlein even said they were made to clean floors with guards sitting on their backs, and he says he was refused to use toilet facilities and also made to stand in cold showers for long times. Alexander Scotland would later write in his memoir how Nerchlein wasn't even interrogated at the London cage, as he was clearly guilty of the war crime and massacre, and that in his last nights at the cage, he began shrieking in a half-crazed fashion so that the guards were at a loss as how to control him, and even the local police inquired about the noise emanating from the quiet Kensington Palace Gardens. Nerkline was later killed for his involvement in the war crimes, and his experiences at the cage were thrown out, and deemed irrelevant in establishing his guilt. More torture allegations would arise in 1947 against the London cage when 21 Gestapo and police officers were tried for the murder of 50 RAF officers who had been shot tunnelling their way out of the Stalag Luft III in the famous breakout recreated in the film, The Great Escape. The court in Hamburg heard how many of the defendants had been starved and systematically beaten at the London centre and had been locked in cold showers and threatened with electricity. They also told a similar story of sleep deprivation and Scotland in his memoir would laugh off these allegations and stated that he was greatly troubled by the constant focus on these shortcomings and he regarded the tales of the cruelty as manufactured. He also accused those specific prisoners of making a bigger story of their interrogation at the expense of those 50 officers who had been murdered. When the Red Cross entered the cage and were allowed access, which Alexander Scotland had fought against for a while, they found very little evidence of poor treatment, and it seems that the 10 prisoners who were suffering the most had been moved to a POW camp before the inspector's arrival. Although there were a number of complaints lodged against the London cage, the Red Cross didn't really do much about it, as they had been told its closure was imminent. The work of the London cage was wound down in autumn 1948, and its inmates were transferred across to prisoner of war camps. So the London cage developed a rather notorious reputation for torture and ill treatment, which was guarded behind the Official Secrets Act. It's most probable that torture did occur behind the doors of those grand houses in Kensington Palace Gardens, and that those officers who performed this probably believed they were doing the right thing to help extract information. Torture used as a method of extracting info is incredibly controversial, however it seems that in particular at this specific British office and interrogation centre, good treatment wasn't always at the top of the agenda. One thing to consider though, is the nature of the criminals that were passing through the doors of the cage. These were ardent Nazis and members of the SS, who were often accused and later found guilty of committing horrific massacres and crimes against humanity. Much of the evidence gathered at the cage was used in subsequent trials, and possibly without this information, then these men could have walked away without justice being applied. That is of course, if you believe justice using the death penalty is sufficient in these crimes. Once again thanks for watching. To support our channel, 
please make sure to subscribe. And once again, thank you so much for watching.